Seated, please. Well, good morning, church. I'd like to welcome you to Big Hill Christian Church this morning. It's so good to see everybody here in the sanctuary. It's also good to know that there are those on live stream this morning. I'd like to welcome you as well. And uh, I know we have several people, our regular attendees that are watching live stream this morning, as well as some new folks today. So welcome to our church. Uh, I hope you enjoy the service this morning. Jim has a wonderful message later from Romans, and I'll talk a little about that in just a moment. Uh, I guess it's good to see everybody out here today, a rainy day, still a good crowd. We had a good crowd for the uh, 9 o'clock service this morning, so it's been a great day so far, even with the rain. Uh, we ask you to continue to be healthy at church, continue to follow our guidelines we have. I know everybody's familiar with those by now. Uh, so, you know, mask when you exit and enter, and please try to social distance if you can. And uh, we may still be doing this for a while. Communion and offering will be done today, as we've been doing in the past. Offering box at the back of the sanctuary as you leave, and in the foyer, you can just drop it in the box. As I said before, I think we're probably going to continue to use that for quite some time. It seems to be working out very well. Communion. Uh, hope you picked up a communion cup on the way in. That'll be later in our service, actually towards the end of our service. If you didn't get a communion cup on your way in and you'd like to have one, uh, raise your hand and make sure one of the ushers, Dwayne or someone, gets you one of those. So uh, just for that. Uh, 
I only have a couple announcements, not much to share with this morning. Uh, one thing I do want to cover, though, is our More Than Bricks campaign. I'm looking around. I'm sure everybody that's here in the sanctuary is familiar with the More Than Bricks campaign. For those that might be on uh, Facebook or live stream, uh, that is a campaign we kicked off about a year and a half ago to focus on paying our mortgage. We do have a substantial mortgage on the building, and we do have a monthly mortgage payment. So we've been uh, tracking this over the last year plus of how giving towards our mortgage funds going. It's going fairly well. Uh, I'm not going to share any slides with you today, but I will say that these charts will be posted in the foyer, and they have uh, year-to-date numbers on there each month. I uh, will mention that uh, for the month of, of uh, July and as well as August, we fell a little bit short of our goal. Our goal is $7,688 a month. That is our actual monthly mortgage payment we have to make. Uh, in July, we had a little over $6,400. Uh, against that target, and in August we had 5700 and a few dollars for that. So that means we're, for the month of August we fell about 1900 short. So only my request today is that you continue to be diligent about your giving towards our More Than Bricks campaign, our mortgage payoff, and as I mentioned many times, it's a long-term commitment on us as a congregation to pay off this wonderful facility that the Lord has blessed us with. So I just ask you to stay uh, diligent about that. At the same time, though, I'll mention that our normal tithes and offering are going quite well. So as uh, other churches have struggled during this pandemic, financially, I mean, uh, we haven't had that struggle. So that's a tribute to the faith and commitment of all of our members uh, about continuing to be diligent about your giving toward the Lord. Uh, and I've said before, even though we didn't have church for nine weeks, we still had nearly all the expenses. We still kept all of our staff on board and paid those. We had utilities and building mortgage, everything continued. You guys really stepped up. So thank you from the church leadership. And I know the Lord is pleased with that because he loves a cheerful giver. So enough said on uh, More Than Bricks. Again, those charts will be posted in the foyer. They are actually already posted in there if you want to see specific numbers and how we're doing for the year. Um, Let's see, other announcements I had, I only had a couple. Uh, remember tonight, uh, Going Deeper session here at 6 o'clock, on site as well as live stream. Also adult Bible study, Wednesday night, also at 6 o'clock, and also live stream or on site as well. So keep those two things in mind, and I'm sure Jim will mention those later at uh, some point in his message. Um, I think that's the... Uh, Oh, one more other thing. A few weeks ago, we mentioned the food bank. The church does have a food bank. And uh, we requested to think about that and bring some food. And Kenny tells me that you guys responded. So thank you to everyone that supported our food bank by bringing some non-perishable foods. And that food bank is actually a cabinet, I guess you'd say, instead of shelves out in the foyer. If you want to continue to do that, which we would encourage you to, just bring those items, and the ushers will get it to the right spot when you come in the morning. Just drop it off somewhere in the foyer, and they'll take care of this. But thank you for that effort. This morning, uh, Jim's going to continue his message in Romans. He's been in the book of Romans for a few weeks now. Today, he's going to be in chapter 8, and his title of his message is No Condemnation, No Separation. So he is going to hit that this morning. You should, when you came in, you were able to get a I, uh, I guess you call it a notes for his sermon today. And it looks something like this. It's got today's date on it. So if you didn't get one of those and like to have one, again, raise your hand. And Dwayne will make sure you get one of those. But uh, that'll, be a, that'll be the outline of Jim's sermon today. He has another wonderful message from Romans as we continue that series. So with that, I'm going to, uh, one other thing, I'm going to say thank you to our praise team for giving us a wonderful song to start with this morning, Unstoppable God. Our God is unstoppable, to say the least. He's always here. He's always strong. He's going to be in place forever. So I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then I'm going to turn it back over to the praise team to lead us in a couple more songs before Jim brings his morning message. Pray with me. Father, we're so thankful to be in your house this morning, and we're so thankful for all the many things you bless us with. Father, you give us challenges. We know that. But, Father, as uh, Jim mentioned a week or two ago, that you know, without challenges and difficulties, uh, maybe we're not doing enough. So, Father, we know those challenges are for your good and for those that love you. So, Father, thank you so much for everything you give us, even the challenges. Father, I can feel you here this morning, and you've been here with us for a few hours already. And, Father, just continue to do them. Bless us. Bless our service this morning as we continue. And, Father, there's one out there this morning that may be here in the sanctuary that needs you or maybe on live stream that needs you. Father, I pray that you'll give them the courage and the strength to reach out to someone, somebody, some church, some place, that they can find you and find that peace that they may need. 
Father, I know we struggle with lots of things. Uh, some very challenging and difficult at this very point in time. But Father, I know you can take care of all of those, and we know that too, Father. But we had to put you first and think about you first. So Father, I'll be with Jim this morning. He brings us another powerful message from Romans, a letter written to Rome, but also written to Richmond. And let us uh, hear the words that we need to hear and do and act, make the changes we need to make, Father, for your glory. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us.
church.
morning, church. Good to see everybody. Get your Bibles out. And while we're, while we're doing that, I'd like for you to like for you to do a little exercise for me. Look, look to the person beside you and say, I'm glad you're here. Now, if they didn't do that, look to the person beside you and say, I'm praying for you. I wanted to put a smile on your face because this morning is, is a great passage of Scripture. Romans chapter 8. It's a chapter that, that changed the lives of, of a couple of the, of the Protestant reformers. It, 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 it'll have an impact on us, but it'll also, this morning, I truly believe, if we will allow ourselves, we can't help but leave here encouraged this morning. So if you will, go with me to Romans chapter 8. Let's look at verse 1. <clears throat> Therefore, because of all that we studied up to this point, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Just bask in that a minute. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Pray with me. Fathers, we come into your presence this morning and read these words. We realize the significance of your love for us. All that is being said here, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus is made available because of Jesus Christ. His obedience to you, his death on the cross, his burial and his resurrection, the gospel message that we have today. So, Father, as we go through this chapter and look at specific passages, Father, I pray that you speak to us. Speak to our hearts. Help us, Lord, to, to, to see what it is you're saying to us. Not, not just from the standpoint of being able to take it in, but to let it out. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. After we get done this morning, we will be halfway through our study in Romans. And if you look at where we've come, we've, we've come from the sinful state that we begin in because of Adam's sin, the original sin, the depravity of man that we have. We've moved into salvation, the saving faith through grace that we have in Jesus Christ. This morning, we're going to talk about the sanctification of our lives, moving on to sovereignty, justification, and glorification. So we're, we're about in the middle of this. And as we, as we go through the passages this morning, when we begin with, with verse 1, we know that, that, we, that we are not condemned because we are in Christ, but we still struggle. Amen? We still fight. E even though we have that, that salvation, that, that sanctification we're going to talk about here in a minute, even though we have those things, the battle still goes on. Like we talked last week in, in, in chapter 7. Where Paul said, the things I want to do, I don't. The things I don't want to do, I do. What a mess I am. That continues to go on, and that is because there are two forces in our presence today. There, there's the, the sinful state, the mindset of the flesh, which is hostile toward God, and the mindset of the spirit, which provides life and peace through a life in Jesus Christ. So here's, what I'll, here's your first question. I believe it's not the first thing on your handouts. I, I, I don't have one with me, but I believe it's the first thing on your handouts. <clears throat> Why does a non-Christian live like a non-Christian? Now, before you snicker and think he's lost his mind, think about that. Why do they live the way they live? And the answer is because that's who they are. Here again, seems oversimplified. But, the, but the, the, the mindset, the life of a non-Christian is lived because that's how they identify. They identify with the world. Their mind is set on the flesh. They, they look to what is available to them for their own sake. That's just how they are. It's in their DNA. That's the way it's made up. So the following question, again, seems pretty simple. Why does a Christian live like a Christian? Because they're a Christian. Makes sense. But here again, 
It's a life that has died to the world, to the flesh, that is now alive in Christ Jesus. They, they live a life that is in service and in love and in admiration and respect and worship to Christ. That's a Christian's DNA. That's who they are. But the big question, how can a Christian live like a non-Christian? Truth of the matter is, they can't. You either are or you not, you're not. There is no blending of the two. If you look in the passage here, look at verse 5 in chapter 8. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is, is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. I'm hoping that we're beginning to take an introspective look at ourselves. You ask that question, how can a Christian live like a non-Christian? And we begin asking ourselves, how am I living? Do I see myself as worldly? Probably not, because I'm sitting here in church. But do I see myself as a Christian? And all that that entails. And we question ourselves, don't we? Kind of like Paul, I want to be. I hope to be. I think I am. I wonder sometimes why I do what I do. But I still call myself a Christian. Well, am I really or am I not? And we realize, like, hopefully what we learned last week, as long as we have that struggle going on in us and we are striving to be like Christ because Christ is in us with the Holy Spirit guiding us, we see that we are. But the thing that we see in this picture here in verses 5 and 6, we begin to see we are brought out of the state that we were in and we are brought into a state set apart from the world and here's where we get that big church word sanctified we are set apart for a different purpose to live for Christ and not for the world so as as we look at this we begin to see where we have come from and hopefully this morning the passages that I want to look this morning to show us what we have and, and what that set apart looks like and leads to. So if you will, go with me to verse 9. And in verse 9, we, we, we hopefully we can continue that separation. However, you are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. The righteousness that we have through the grace and the faith that we possess in Jesus Christ. That's what brings us out, brings us into a righteous state. We are forgiven for our sins. No condemnation anymore for that. We are sanctified, set apart, living Christ in us, for us, through us. Now, if you will, go with me to verse 12. It's said that, that verses 12 through 14 are the verses that Martin Luther read, and it broke him. This is where he began the Protestant movement against the, uh, the Reformation kind of thing that took place in his life that began to lead us into, into the Reformation. In verse 12, it says, So then, brethren, we are under obligation, we are indebted to, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the flesh you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God these are the sons of God. Think about that. If you live for the flesh, you must die. Now, there's two ways to look at that. 
we know that if we live in the flesh, which we do, we're going to die someday. But he's also saying here, if that's what you live for, you must die to that in order to live in Christ. And it is said that Martin Luther read this and it took him a great deal of time to quit crying and overcome the conviction that it placed on his heart. And I pray that we see that too. There are two things. We're either in the flesh or in the spirit. Then Paul begins to, to, to leave that and goes into the struggle that we have in realizing who it is we are in Christ. In verses 15 and 16, he says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Now you look at this, and it's interesting. I think if you look at, if you look at the end of verse 15, it says, <clears throat> we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, if you look at the word Abba, that was the Jewish term for daddy. A, a, a child crying out to their father, daddy. But beside that is also the word father. It's not a duplication. It's a support. Father, or the Greek pater, was their way of saying father. So he's saying to the Jew... Abba, to the Greek, pater, Abba, Father, both of you. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. All of us recognize the Father that we are the child of. And as a child, we are joint heirs, even with Jesus Christ. Think about that. We have gone from sin to salvation to sanctification in a relationship to where we are a brother or sister to Jesus Christ himself, an heir to the Father. And we are able to come to the Father at any time and cry out, Daddy, why would we do that? Because we are suffering here on earth. Tribulation, persecution, anxiety worldly temptations all around us that they come to the point to where we suffer and we realize that we suffer just like Christ suffered another similarity that brings us together as an heir to God then we, he goes on in, in 18 down through 25 and, and goes into more detail in there and here here's where I'm I'm hoping and, I, and I'm assuming that is when we started this study, y'all are reading Romans each week. If you remember, I ask if you, if you can, please read the book of Romans every week. Divvy it up in two or three chapters a day and read it through every week so that, so that we, we know what we're talking about. We know what we're looking to, the questions that we have come up, and we can talk about them. And if we go through this, then, then you, you pretty much can track with me where I am because at times we're going to go really deep. And we're about to here right now. So I pray that, that you've read this and you understand what Paul is saying about our struggles and the similarities that we have that we can draw to and, and, and trying to, to see that life in Christ lived as Christ lived. And we see the similarities in him coming to earth, taking on flesh, realizing that he struggled like we struggled. He goes on into verse 26. I want to read 26 down through 27. <clears throat> kind of looking at the question, how are we supposed to live like heaven here on earth? How do, how do we live like the spirit while we have flesh and bone bodies? He says, in the same way the spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and he, and he who searches the hearts knows the mind of the spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, I want, you, I want you to notice in here 
the, the phrase, the Spirit intercedes. And, and notice that it says, <clears throat> in the same way the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should. The phrase here does not say, not if we do not know how to pray. It doesn't say, if, for, for if we do not know how to pray as we should, the Spirit intercedes. It says, flat out, we don't know how to pray sometimes. There, there are times we are so overwhelmed with, with anxiety, fear, frustration, health issues, relationship issues, all of these things that, 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 that bombard us. There are times we go to the Lord and we just flat don't have the words. You ever do that? Sometimes we get so caught up in what's going on around us, we forget to pray. And when we do go to the Lord, Abba, Father, and we pray, how do we pray? This says you don't have the words. But I want us to look a little deeper. Maybe, maybe we don't have the words, but when we go to the Lord without those words, what kind of attitude, what kind of presence do we have when we go to the Lord? I've got five questions here. And I want you to consider these. When we're overwhelmed by our situations, whatever they are, and we go to the Lord, are we more intent on God hearing our pain or on hearing God's healing instruction? When we go to God, do we approach Him with an attitude or with humility? You ever gone to God and said, God, I need you to do this. God, here's what I, here's what I want you to do. Or God, here's what I need. Do, do we go to him that way? Or do we remember scripture that stays in our hearts where it says, cast your cares and burdens on me and I'll give you rest. And we come to him saying, Lord, I need, I need, you, I need you to take this. I need rest. Do we ask the Lord to speak to our hearts? Or do we ask the Lord to listen to our words that we shouldn't speak sometimes, that we don't know how to speak, but our attitude speaks for us? You ever argue with somebody that never says a word to you, but you know they're mad by their body language, their attitude? There are times, not, not necessarily with you all, but with the, the folks in first, first church, our early church, most of them wear their masks. Sometimes in second service when I'm preaching, I can tell how you're receiving the message. But first service, there's sometimes I don't know. All I can see is that. And I can tell when they're smiling because their eyes are up, but when they're not, I don't know. When we argue with somebody, are we more intent on them hearing what we have to say or in finding a solution to the argument? Is that how we approach the Lord? And maybe we're so mad that's why we don't know what to say because we have not allowed ourselves to humble ourselves and enter into the presence of the Father, Abba and maybe my last question do we understand that prayer is a two way communication take your Bibles put, put your finger there in Romans go left, let's go to Psalm 46 I want, I want to share a passage of scripture with you Psalm 46. <clears throat> Look at verse 10. Now, I'm going I'm to read from the New American Standard, and, and it says, Psalm 46, verse 10, Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. When we come to the Lord, when we come into his presence, some translations say, be still and know that I am God. That's probably the way you see it on coffee cups and bumper stickers and those kind of things. But as we look at that, what, what is that saying to us? To me, 
It's saying, settle down. When we come to God overwhelmed, and we have these problems, and we come to the Lord, and we come with that, God, you got to do this attitude to him. He's saying, sit down. Settle yourself. Hush. Who do you think you're talking to? I am God. I will be exalted in the nations. I will be exalted on, on the earth. You're not me. Quit fighting me and listen. Stop arguing with me. Now, can we do that? When, when we're upset, when we're mad, I mean, when you look around us today and, and we look at all that's going on in the world today, is it overwhelming? Do we get upset about it? Yeah. How do we go to God with our prayers? Do we say, Lord, show me? Or do we say, Lord, you've got to do something? Hush. Listen. And the thing that I think happens more often than I'm personal experience, when I go to the Lord that way and listen to what he has to say, do I get peace and calmness and assurance and joy? More often than not, no, I don't. I'm burdened with something. The Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, I am doing something about it. I put you in the pulpit at Big Hill Christian Church. I gave you that situation so that you could allow me to work through you and take my message to people. I gave you the talents and the abilities to do what I have equipped you to do. And I put you where you are so you can use those and do what I want you to do. It's not a, hey, sit back, I got this kind of thing. It's what he says to me. He says, roll up your sleeves, go to work. That ever happened to you? Do we ever go to the Lord for, for comfort and peace? And we get conviction and burdens? Yeah. I think you do. I know I do. But when we do that, we go on to verse 28. And this is a passage of Scripture that is very familiar, but it's also very powerful. It is also very dangerous. Look at 28 and 29. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, here's what I want you to do. Take a minute, read that verse again. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. What do you want that verse to say? Everything's going to work out. It's all going to be fine. What do you need it to say? Think of the situation you're in right now. Think of the, think of the things that are overwhelming us. And when, we, when we're overwhelmed, a lot of times we go to this scripture. And we use it to kind of calm ourselves saying, well, everything's going to work out for my good. Everything's going to work out for good for me. Show me in that verse where it says that. Where does it say it's going to work out good for me? It does. But there's more to it. You see, when, when you look at that, it, it, it says, and we know. Who are we? Those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Now, if you don't love the Lord and you're not called according to his purpose, this verse doesn't apply to you. Think about that. How often have you heard it said, all things work together for my good? I looked at over 20 translations of Scripture, and I can't see where it says it works for my good. It just works for good. Who causes that good. Look what it says. 
And we know that God causes all things to work for good. Now, if God is causing that, who is the one that uses the standard of what is good? You? Me? Or God? God causes all things to work out for God's good to those of us who love him and are called according to his purpose. If we are called according to his purpose and we love him, we are in Christ. His good is our good. But if not, we use this misconceived notion that it's all going to work out for me in an earthly, fleshly kind of way. No. Let's go and look at 29. For those, going back to verse 28, good to, to those who love God, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of, of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren, and these whom he predestined, he also called. And these who he, whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, if we are those people, then we have been foreknown. Who has God foreknown? Everybody. He created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Before I knew you, before I formed you, I knew you. I have plans for you. Plans for hope, to prosper. So he knows each and every one of us. So who did he foreknow? Everybody. And those that he foreknew, all of us, he predestined. Now here it gets dangerous. Because predestined to many people means that he hand-selected certain individuals. Well, if you go to the Greek and you look up the word predestined, you get the word horizo, to where we get our word horizon, which means to set the boundaries. He knows us. He sets boundaries for us, a plan for our lives, plans for hope, to prosper. I think the best way I know to, to, to illustrate that is if, if I were to say, okay, I'm inviting all of you over to my house this afternoon. We're going to barbecue ribs. That has been predetermined. That has been predestined. That's what I'm going to do. You have the option to come or not to come. If you come, we'll have barbecued ribs. If you don't, I get more barbecued ribs. But it doesn't change the fact that that's there. And you have been invited. Now, full disclaimer, don't come to my house this afternoon. Give me, give me some notice. I set a stage that I can't, I can't complete. Hope, you know, joyfully God has it all in control for his side of it. This was just an illustration. I hope it worked. But he foreknew us. He predestined our path. And he called us. Now here again, you go to the Greek and you look up called. You know how that translates? Called. He invited you. Just like I would invite you over, he invited us. He knows us. He set this plan for us. He called us to participate in that plan. And in so doing, he, he justifies and glorifies us. When we answer that call, we are justified, taken out of sin into life, into a righteous state before God. We are justified by accepting that call and placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And there will come a time where we will be glorified. And we sing about that in a lot, of, especially in a lot of the older hymns. When we all get to heaven, what a day that will be. And that's the part where we're suffering right now. We're overwhelmed by things. We're anxious 
for that coming, Paul uses the illustration of pregnancy. There's pain that mounts and mounts and builds, but it's endured because there is life afterward and a celebration that takes place. That pain brings about that completedness, that glorification that, that, we, will, that we will see. With that understood, Paul now goes from teacher to preacher. And he calls for a response. Look at verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Another one of your bullets in there. How, how do we walk in the Spirit? Obedience. And when we are obedient and we realize all of these things, what do we say about it? And here's, here's where I want you to, to take, let's take a minute and kind of recap. We have been brought out of death into life. We have been created with a plan for our lives, a, a path to take, a commission to complete. And we have been set apart and given everything we need to do that and he's saying here now what more could you need what what more could you want what do you say to this it's kind of you know, I, I get I'm kind of a sports nut but you kind of you kind of get the kind of get the impression of the coach in the locker room right before the game what do you say guys you ready we've been practicing we've got everything set we know the opponent we know our game plan we know what we're going to do what do you say guys Hopefully we say, let's go get them. That, that's what Paul is saying here. What do you say to this? He goes on and, and says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Now here again, th this is a very powerful passage, but it can also be a very dangerous passage. And here's, here's what I mean. <clears throat> I hope, and I'm kind, of, I'm kind of taking a side track trick just for a minute. I'm hoping that the handout that you have has questions on it and lines on it because somehow when I put my notes together, some of my personal notes are in that stack somewhere. And part of that is a copy of a page out of Eugene Peterson's The Message. If you have that, throw it away right now. Don't, don't, don't go there. I want to compare what he says to what Scripture says here. And this, this in my opinion, shows, shows the danger involved in a paraphrase. Now, a, a paraphrase Scripture, a paraphrase Bible, in my opinion, is a commentary. It's somebody's opinion of what that Scripture says. And, and, and Scripture plainly tells us, study to show yourself approved. Be diligent to be a workman, accurately handling the divine Word of God. To just read that for ease's sake is not what we're called to do. But a lot of people go to the paraphrase because it's easier to read. It's also easier to be misled. And here, I think, is a, is a perfect example. Let's go back to... 28 where it said those who are those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose if we look at verse 31 now my Bible New American Standard now I'm sure your translation if it's a translation not a paraphrase says what then shall we say to these things if God is for us who is against us the message says so what do you think with God on our side like this how can we lose? Do you see the difference? Do you see how that slants just a little? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is on our side, how can we lose? If we are truly God's children, 
foreknown, predestined, called, justified, glorified. We see that in the way it's written. But if we are not a Christian, if we are not struggling with the things that we do and searching for a deeper meaning as God speaks to us, and we see this, if God's on my side, how can I lose? We see that as God working for us. And that's not what this says. It is not God working for us. It is God working in us, through us, for His will, for His glory, for His honor, not ours. But we take this sometimes to mean that if God's with me, I can do anything because He's behind me in this. We're not in charge. It's like the old, the old bumper stickers. I, I don't see them much anymore, but the, the, remember those bumper stickers that says, God is my co-pilot? That's saying that God's subordinate, supporting me. He's got my back. No, God is in the lead. If that's the case, switch seats. You're, you're the co-pilot. You're, you're the one that's following him. He's not following you. Abraham Lincoln, it, it said during the Civil War, he had all his generals together. And before they started planning out one of their, their strategies, one of the generals said, Sir, should we ask for God to be on our side? And he said, I'm not concerned about that. I'm more concerned that we are on his side. You see the difference? It, it, it's not that God is cutting us loose to do what we want, and he's saying, I've got you wherever you go. He's saying, throw away all that encumbers and follow me. So there, there, is a, there is a huge difference, and, and I hope we see that. Let's go on to 32. <clears throat> it says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Here again, if we have Christ, and, and he is, we are alive in him, we have everything we need. Now he begins to ask more questions. Who will bring a charge against God? Who can say God's doing this wrong? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of God? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. He's not saying these things won't come. He's saying who can separate us from God's love through these things. We're told over and over, we're going to have tribulation. We're going to have trials. We're told to rejoice when that happens because just like we read here and in other places, we know that because Christ is alive in us with the Holy Spirit in us, we have everything we need to overcome. Not just to be delivered from, but to have victory in. He goes on and says, he quotes the Old Testament, For your sake we are being put to death all day. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Yeah, we, we die all the time. We die for Christ. We die in Christ. We're considered to be like sheep for the slaughter. The world's going to get, we're done. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. None of us are going to get a pass on this. We will go through these things. But then he follows that with 37. But in all these things, all these things, not some, not a few, not most, all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. We don't slide by. We're not delivered from. We don't conquer. We overwhelmingly conquer. We can't be defeated. We overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us, Christ, in us. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. 
nothing. And that should put a smile on your face. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. No created thing. Now, can you think of anything that is not created? Yeah. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Everything else is under that. Nothing can rise up and take over. No body, no thing, no time, no place, no way, no how. Overwhelmingly, we conquer through Jesus Christ. That brings me back to my original question. Why does a Christian live like a Christian? Because they know that they have the Holy Spirit in us, living in Christ in a world that we overcome overwhelmingly. No matter what happens to us, no matter what happens with us, no matter, we overwhelmingly conquer through Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? If we do, we need to live it. And I challenged you last week. I want to challenge you this. I want to challenge you every week. And I've, I've used this before, but I think it, it bears repeating. Knowing what we know now, knowing what, knowing what Paul is writing to us, what God is saying to us through Paul in this book, not just to the church in Rome, but to the church in Richmond, knowing this, why have we ever felt defeated and you have I know you have we all have we struggle have you ever just sometimes just said I give up this is never going to get better this is never going to change they're never going to love me I'm never going to get better I'm always going to be where I am and we just give up you ever been there that's a Christian living like a non-Christian we overwhelmingly conquer. Not death, nor life, nor principalities, nor accusations. Nothing separates us from his love. And because of his love, we have victory in Christ. As a Christian, fully understanding what this says and what this means and what we have, what would you try to do if you knew you couldn't fail? Now, you've heard me say that several times before, and you'll probably hear me say it more, because I think that many times we are so overwhelmed, we have conditioned ourselves to settle. And when we settle, we stop. It's being in a rut. And I've heard the definition of a rut is nothing but a grave with both ends kicked out. Never coming out of it. overwhelmingly conquer now tonight we're going to go deeper into this and, and if you would like to after service this morning if you've got questions or something you'd like to talk to me about just stop me we'll go to my office and we'll talk but I, I, I hope that we see the joy the victory the, the, the peace the life that comes through Christ in this and I hope that none of us leave here not fully understanding that we're victorious we are conquerors through Christ. And the world out there needs to be conquered. And we're the army. We're the children. We're the heirs. We, we are the ones with everything we need to get the job done, given to us by the one who cannot be defeated by any created thing. That ought to put a spring in our step. That ought to send us out here ready to go to work. But it's your call. Just like the rib thing. 
You can come or you can stay. It's not going to change God's plan, but it's going to change your eternity. Think about that. Pray with me. Father, as we come to a time of invitation, I, I, I pray that we've heard your word, not, not just through my mouth, but, but, but through the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts. And Lord, as, as we say, sometimes when we come to you overwhelmed by all that life has us going through, we have a tendency to, to be over-emotional, upset, anxious, frustrated, mad. And we come to you seeking answers, but we don't wait to hear what they are. And often when we do hear your answers, they're, they're burdens that are placed on us to convict us, to be drawn closer to you, more obedient to your word, more mature in our walk. Lord, help us to, to realize that, that you're not going to place us in a position that you haven't equipped us to be in. And to realize that, that we won't only squeak through this, we will overwhelmingly conquer it because we have allowed you to call us. And we've answered that call. And you're working not only in us, but through us to accomplish your good in our lives. Lord, help us to see that. And help us to realize it's available right now to those of us who are struggling with it, that have been searching for it, not realizing how to ask for it. We're afraid to ask, but we're also afraid to allow the Holy Spirit to intercede for us. So, Lord, I pray as we go through this invitation that we come into your presence as Abba, Father, and we sit still. We quit fighting, and we listen to you to speak to our hearts. And then we rise up and we become obedient to your word in a new life in Christ with you at the front. Father, help us to see that. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you will, please stand with us.
Please be seated. We've uh, we've come to a time of communion, and if you're you're visiting with us, we practice an open communion. If you're a baptized believer in Jesus Christ, we invite you to to participate with us. I want to read uh, the last the last bit that I read in in the message in the sermon this morning, in in, uh, verse verse 38, chapter 8, Romans. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. You know why that is? Because Christ paid the price. And because he willingly suffered, bled, and died for you and for me. And nothing can take that away from us. And as we take these emblems, we're reminded nothing can separate us from that love. Pray with me. Father, as we come around your table, I pray that that's that's the the foremost thought in our minds right now, the price that was paid and the state that we're in in the relationship with you. Nothing, nothing can separate us from your love. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, thank you for, for being with us today. And I pray that uh, you come back this evening, 6 o'clock. We're, we're going to go deeper into this. So whether, whether you come, at, come here physically at church or connect with us on Facebook at, at 6 o'clock, let's, let's go deeper into what he's saying to us and put some practical application to, to our steps. If you will, please stand. Let's, let's be dismissed. <clears throat> Father, thank you for your words. Thank you for for working through the life of Paul to write this letter to to the Romans and and to those of us in Richmond to realize the message is the same the call is still to to rise up and to rally around the gospel and to bring the lost to the Savior Father give us that that angst in in our life to to be obedient to your word and and to live a life of, of victory as an overwhelming conqueror with Christ alive in our hearts. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for being with us.